Well, welcome, welcome back, everybody. Um, recording, recording is in progress, so I'm um, assuming we're getting going again now. So uh, we come to the last but not least, the last part of the, uh, the, the morning session, uh, where we're going to focus on collaboration and practice. We're pleased to welcome Suzanne Robertson and Suzanne Ryan from Aberdeenshire Council, who are going to uh, kick this session off, and then we'll go on to John Problem from the Clyde Mission. So I think without, and then we'll have questions and answers after after that. So without any further ado, Suzanne's over to you. Thank you, Charlie. Good morning for for those that um, don't know me. My name is Suzanne Robertson. I'm the Regeneration Executive for Aberdeenshire Council. And um, prior to that, um, I was Business Development Executive. I'm um, also working for Aberdeenshire Council, so, so I held that role for about eight years. We were here today really um, to talk to you about collaboration and practice, in particular vacant properties within Peterhead Town Centre. Why did we create Invest in Peterhead? Um, so for those of you that, um, that don't know does Peterhead um, in terms of location, we are the largest town within Aberdeenshire within a, with a population of just over 19,500. We're based around a 40 mile drive from, from Aberdeen, which is the, the oil capital of Europe. And we've got the largest fish market um, by vessels landed in the UK. So there's quite a lot of investment activity that happens in and around Peterhead. It's quite diverse from everything from food and drink through to the energy sector. But Peterhead as a place is, although it's got those um, significant investments going on, what we did tend to see is that those investments didn't necessarily translate back into our town centre area where we're experiencing quite high vacancy rates. So why did we create Invest in Peterhead? We had a number of neglected properties, quite a high vacancy rate within Peterhead town centre. Um, which was creating a negative impression with all our stakeholders. So, for example, if, if we were um, hosting particular visits and asking for feedback in terms of Peterhead as a place, the first thing that came back to us was um, the condition of the town centre and the number of vacant units within a concentrated area. There was also a lack of diversity in the town centre offering when compared to other similar towns um, of a similar scale. So, for example, we're underrepresented within the leisure sector and we're also underrepresented within food and drink. Wealth was not being retained within the town um, and it tended to be that the local population were travelling to other areas to do their shopping um, and not necessarily um, supporting, supporting their own area. There was no proactive marketing measures in place um, and there was no real information available on Peterhead if you if you were thinking about making an investment or you were thinking about coming into the town there was nothing really available um, that gave you any background information or confirmed the, the, the current status. We also had a regeneration plan um, that was just newly agreed in, in back in 2016 and that had a real focus in terms of the town centre and, and, and also putting that additional resource in there. Along with the fact that um, Rediscover Peterhead, um, who's the new business improvement district, had a successful vote in 2016. So taking all this into account, we thought, um, how do we change things within Peterhead Town Centre? How do we tackle these high vacancy rates and, and really start to, to work on the issues that were behind these buildings being empty? So we'd done a bit of background research to, to look at the issues um, and, and they were quite varied in terms of was quite a number of poor building conditions. So the development costs generally outweighed the final end market value of these properties, which again was putting off potential investors. There was a lack of investment um, with some of the properties. And again, that was down to a number of different issues in terms of absentee landlords, or it might be that, that the particular property owner couldn't see an end use there. Combined with properties being on the market for over maybe, um, taking some examples, over 10 years, there were unrealistic asking prices as well. And those prices hadn't changed from the time that the property had been marketed from 10 years ago. Um, the VAT penalties in comparison to, to new builds were also a, a major issue for anyone taking on some of the, um, the town centre properties, along with some of these buildings being listed within conservation areas, making building 
um, more costly. There was also a lock of proactive selling at town centre properties. So again, you if you went in to, to, to look at the town centre, if you were trying to find any particular units, you would need to go into each of the individual estate agents to try and locate property if you were looking to, to set up there. And investors were also finding it difficult when they were coming in to, to get any financial backing for redevelopment through the banks, dependent on the sectors that they were looking to develop with. Coupled with that, we also as a council had developed our obligation requirements, which for town centre areas, again, the feedback that we were getting from um, investors is that it wasn't viable to, to be asking for some of these, these um, obligations. And there was also an unclear end use for, for some of these properties as well. So the owners had absolutely no competence to, to make any investment. So, so how did we decide to move things on based, based on the, the feedback that we had? We decided that it needed um, a number of interventions. So, so not one thing was actually going to solve this problem. It was going to take a number of different approaches. So based on the research, we had gone back and we managed to get approval for a property investment fund, which essentially was a two-phased approach. Phase one was that you didn't necessarily need to own the building um, in order to take a feasibility study forward. And that could provide for community groups up to 100% support, or if it was businesses that were interested, up to 50% support. For phase two, if the development was to be taken forward, then again, there was an incentive in terms of phase two, so it was a contribution made towards the capital costs of the project with intervention levels no higher than 25%. Than and again, that was based on feedback um, from, from some of the buildings that we'd taken that you were looking at about a 25% intervention level to, to bring those properties into what would be stated as, as being viable. Aberdeenshire Council also agreed to make a developer obligation free specifically around those town centre um, boundaries. And again, that was to, to encourage more investors to come in. We also commissioned the local data company um, as I'd mentioned earlier, we, we knew that we were underrepresented in certain sectors. So again, we needed to get a data-based approach, um, which confirmed the, the gaps and opportunities that we were missing within the, the town centre. We also created um, a stakeholder-led group, um, and that was made up of investors, architects, Aberdeenshire Council, the local bid, property owners themselves, and also business owners were quite key as well. Now that had taken us um, quite a bit of time to set up. So again, we, we started that process back in 2018 um, and continued to work. So, so we've got quite a strong um, stakeholder led group now. Through that stakeholder group, we, we identified that we needed to do something around the marketing collateral um, and also create some um, prospectus document. And again, that would be highlighting the opportunities within Peterhead Town Centre specifically on those empty properties and also to put in some potential end uses and, and really visualise those so that the investors could see. The bid decided to, to go in and they recruited a marketing assistant. And again, that was to reposition Peterhead and, and start to really sell those positive messages in terms of the investment that was happening externally, but also the investment that was happening, happening within the town centre. And that's been a real asset in terms of getting the message out there and, and getting others to collaborate. We also developed an inquiry system through the stakeholder group, which meant it was a one-stop shop inquiry, where if an inquiry came in for town centre premises, it was dealt with through, through one individual who then pulled in the, the others that were required. And we pitched to suitable businesses that had been identified. So if we knew that we had a food and drink requirement, then we would go and specifically pitch um, to, to some of those sectors. The next slide demonstrates the, the partnership working um, in collaboration with um, the different property owners, the estate agents, and the different groups that we really managed to get involved. So we linked in Invest Aberdeen, who are an inward investment um, agency. Again, they advertise Peterhead, so, so anyone looking um, for property within there, um, it will connect directly through to, to from Invest in Aberdeen through to Invest in Peterhead. 
and we made sure that with anyone that had um, a specific interest within the town centre that they were included as part of this group. So collectively we discussed the barriers and opportunities to bring in these units back into use and um, feel that the stakeholder group was critical because everyone brought along a different knowledge and expertise. We set the goals for the project and worked together to get as many properties back into use within a defined area. And at this point, I'll hand over to Suzanne Rind. Thanks, Suzanne. Um, so having heard about the process today, what sort of achievements have we seen as a result of putting that process into place? So all stakeholders are now aware of all the investment information and are working together proactively to not only market Peter Head, but to change perceptions in the town. This has led to the group actively targeting businesses which have expressed an interest to expand and inviting them to talk Peter Head. Linking in with partners at all levels has been key and this has led to, as Suzanne just explained, invest in, um, in Peter Head now sitting under the Invest Aberdeen umbrella, a uh, focus in the region for economic activity. And it's also created interest from other key local stakeholders to support the campaign, such as the Peter Head Prison Museum and the Port Authority. Working with colleagues in planning, we have produced proactive planning schedules which have been developed to showcase what each property could offer. The example shown in the picture here is 50 Marshall Street, and this has been considered suitable for change of use from retail to a cafe or restaurant, for example. This upfront investigation helps to reduce some of the work for an interested investor. And fundamentally, during the time the scheme has been operating, the town centre has seen a reduction in vacancy rates, which is highlighted in the graph here. This shows a fall of nearly 1.5% from the peak, and this is in spite of the challenges faced on the high street in relation to changing shopping trends and the COVID-19 pandemic. Continuing on with those achievements, a key element of Invest in Peter Head has been about building up a clear picture of local needs in the associated property and investment market. This focus on intelligence gathering has directly influenced the success of the scheme, attracting many new businesses into neglected vacant premises since the scheme started. The majority of these new businesses are local enterprises or small regional chains. And this is a result of local entrepreneurs now having a higher level of confidence in Peterhead as a place to invest. Through the Business Improvement District, we discover Peterhead, the marketing assistant um, was able to be recruited and they were able to give interested parties a single point of contact to go to, to make the process simpler and smoother. Invest in Peterhead also offers a dedicated impartial resource, able to facilitate discussions between sellers and interested buyers, as well as being able to organise external valuations of properties to assist in realistic property negotiations, for example. And finally, the ability to offer tours and to pitch to interested parties has been a positive service, with, for example, Locavore, a Glasgow-based social enterprise, visiting in August 2021 when they were looking to expand out of the central belt. Looking at this slide, I'd now like to highlight some of the specific investments that we have seen in Peterhead since the scheme launched. So here you can see that there are 12 new diverse businesses that have opened in the town during 2020. And highlights include the Arc Cinema, a new five screen cinema in the heart of the town centre. A new beauty therapy shop in premises that had been vacant for over four years, as well as a new home interiors shop. This followed on from a further 12 new businesses opening in 2019, a number of whom were independents. And this list includes um, several food and drink outlets, a craft brewery, travel lodge, Audi, and also a new leisure facility. Into 2021, we continued to see investment in the gaps in the town and investment and expansion from existing owners in the town. This included Specsavers Opticians committing to a six-figure investment in their premises, Brutoon expanding and two new shops a result of the Arc Cinema investment. These two slides illustrate how we've achieved the falling vacancy rates that we outlined earlier. Looking forward, Invest in Peterhead's next focus will be on a number of large buildings in the Broad Street area of the town centre, which are traditionally harder to let, now that vacancies have declined in the initial target area of Marshall Street. We're excited to start that journey with investors and looking at what can be done with those properties. So in summary, working in collaboration has taken time, but the results can be transformative for our places. The key starting points for our point of view was to get stakeholders involved at an early stage, to open up dialogue, understand local needs and agree a plan for the area. 
We hope that you have found the presentation useful, but if you would like to find out more, including viewing a number of video case studies from partners and businesses, you can visit the website at the address shown on the screen, and I'll also pop that into the chat after we finish this presentation. I also have to finish up by saying that I've only been involved with the scheme for a few months, um, and that it was my predecessor in the town centre's role, Audrey Mickey, who worked closely with Suzanne to set this all up. However, it is a programme that is making a real difference in Peterhead, and I'm looking forward to working on such a collaborative project in the coming months and years. Thank you. That's great, Suzanne. Thank you, and thank you to both, both uh, Suzanne's there. So um, that gives us a very clear example of some of the benefits of, uh, of collaboration in a, in a real sort of focused area of, uh, of, one, of one town. Um, move on now to... Uh, to, to John Proven from the Clyde Mission, who's going to uh, uh, give us another uh, another case study. I should say, actually, if you if there are questions that are beginning to emerge uh, from the Su Suzanne's presentation, please just put them in the uh, put them in the chat function, and then we can come on to those after uh, after we've heard from John. So, John, over to you. Um, thank you uh, to the Scottish Land Commission for the chance to to speak at this event today. Um, I'm John Proven, um, currently head of the Clyde Mission at the Scottish Government. Um, reflections recently that I'm in my 32nd year in government, um, across a range of departments, um, but before Clyde Mission, um, most recently I was in, in the Transport Scotland Rail team. Um, community post late last year, so still fairly new to all of this and on a bit of a learning curve. Um, it's an exciting area for me and for my colleagues. And I'm really looking forward to this session just to kind of give, give some of the, 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 the chat and the experience of, of, of kind of working together in collaboration. Um, the title is Clyde Mission, um, but I've tried to focus what I'm going to say on collaboration and practice, um, which was the, the theme of, of, of this bit of the day. Um, so what is Clyde Mission? Um, well, it came into existence in 2020. Um, it's a place-based mission to make the Clyde an engine of sustainable and inclusive growth. Uh, it seeks to bring about benefits at national, regional and local levels. Um, our work focuses on, on the river and the riverside, as you would expect, um, from, from South Lanarkshire to the parts of the Island Butte. Um, and up to around 500 metres um, from the river itself on, on either side. Um, our approach to the Clyde mission and what will be key to success is collaboration. We're working across sectors and with partners, taking an innovative and creative approach to deliver real benefits to the economy and to the communities along the, the length of the Clyde. Some of the partners we work are shown in this slide, um, but there's so many more. So many more involved. And I'm going to try and move this slide on. Hope I'll get it around. Um, oh, there we go. Good. So that's the, the River Clyde. Um, so why focus on the River Clyde? Um, the, the Clyde retains a strong history of, of thriving industry, but it also has a history of, of, of industrial decline in some parts. And this is one of the factors that's led to some areas of economic and social challenges. Um, including abandoned sites and assets along the riverside. There's some stats on the slides just on you know, my right, probably your left, I think. Um, and I've made some comparisons to the city region. It's worth remembering the Clyde Mission footprint does not mirror the city regions. It's a narrower corridor that I've described uh, uh, as shown in this map, and it includes parts of a Island group. The riverside, as we defined it, um, so around 500 metres from the water's edge, covers an area that's equivalent to around 1.2% of the land in the city region. In this uh, strip of land, we can see a lot of people and businesses, over 7% of the region's population, 13% of its businesses, and over 14% of its jobs. In the Clyde, they present, or they present so many opportunities and through the mission, we want to maximise the river's potential as an asset and can support, uh, and one which can support a sustainable economy and, uh, and uh, a just transition to net zero. And a big part of our work 
this is some productive use for the, the, the many pieces, hundreds, in fact, of bacon and derelict sites along the river, which offer a range of potential opportunities from solutions for, for smaller sites in the ages of housing estates that are perhaps unsightly or, or key issues to perhaps larger sites that could bring significant economic opportunity. And while we look to explore new opportunities, we also seek to support existing work and ongoing work, which is a key part of our collaboration, our approach to collaboration. There's also ways in which the river itself can support transition to net zero. Um, for example, there's a heat pump at Queen's Quay near Clyde Bank, which demonstrates um, how through new technology, the river can be used to generate low carbon heat. The path to net zero brings opportunities for businesses to create green jobs and to support our just transition. Um, local communities will need to be supported to, to upskill or, or reskill to secure those jobs and benefit from future riverside developments. We've active communities along the river. Um, I, should, I should know a living one um, who are already taking positive steps to make change happen. Uh, there's a lot of existing investment programmes and there's clusters of high value industry such as financial services and maritime with the potential for growth across a number of sectors. So how do we make the most of the river as a strategic asset and match need with opportunity? Now, can I put simply, we do it together. The Scottish Government convenes Clyde Mission, but we are part of a collective of government organisations and agencies, local authorities and universities, and our engagement spans sectors. The clue is in the title. Um, we're working with Mission Methodology, which was developed by Mariana Mazzucato and the team at University College London. So through the mission approach, um, which is also being used by the Scottish National Investment Bank, we are bringing together partners with the skills, expertise, levers and resources to make change happen. The Clyde mission comprises of five interlinked missions, which you can see on this slide here. Um, I'll not, I'll not uh, repeat them for you, but you see that one of our missions is to use vacant and derelict land for the benefit of the economy, the environment and communities. That vacant and derelict land mission will identify land that can be used as a resource to deliver on the other mission aims, including through commercial opportunities, carbon sequestration, flood management, or connections to and spaces for communities along the riverside. And the vacant and derelict land mission is driven by partners from a range of organisations, including Scottish Land Commission, Scottish Futures Trust, Nature Scott, and Clyde Plan. Through Clyde Mission, We've already invested in 13 diverse projects along the river so far, bringing over £13 million worth of investment. This, this slide here, um, you know, for pictures speak a thousand words, I suppose, shows some of the projects we failed to fund, including a cycle park at Canvas Line and a business access road to Morris Business Park near the river. We have also supported an arts hub in SWG3 in Glasgow's West End, um, which is frequented frequently by my daughter, um, a rural STEM facility in Dunoon, and an active travel route that's created a new connection to the riverside between Paisley and Drainthrough. Not least, the geographic breadth of this investment again demonstrates the reach of the client mission work and a variety of types of investment. It also illustrates, you can see that from the pictures, how such investment has transformed area of, areas of unused land. Um, we have a further £25 million to invest in low carbon heat solutions and more information, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> more information will be available on that uh, later this year. So the right hand here. And as the missions develop proposals for further investment, we will work with others across sectors and partners to combine levers and resources to realise what are our shared ambitions. So progress and, and next steps. Um, kind of 
drilling down a bit more into the vacant and derelict land mission, which I guess will probably be of most interest to those here today. It's currently reviewing the recommendations of the vacant and derelict land task force work and the Scottish Land Commission, excuse me, is closely involved in that work. On behalf of Clyde Mission, Scottish Enterprise is also undertaking initial exploratory work with support from the Green Action Trust to identify sites where greening may be the best solution, sites that don't have an imminent use for other activities, whether commercial or recreational, that could better serve the local community as walking routes or green spaces, and that could be brought forward for delivery quite quickly. We're also working with planning and other colleagues to understand the lessons learned from previous vacant and derelict land developments to develop a strategic approach to the development of the sites that have commercial or other potential uses and to surface potential delivery opportunities. And crucially, um, we will engage with communities to ensure that what we develop helps to create places that can truly benefit those who live and work along the Clyde. In support of this, we're working with colleagues from the Scottish Futures Trust, who recently published a, a, an incredibly helpful guide to implementing a place-based approach. So just a final slide here, um, colleagues, and um, we'll probably be, be glad to hear. Um, so at Clyde Mission, um, above all, we work together. That is our strength. Um, this enables us to tilt to circumstances, tailor our approach, and combine resource, which is very much a feature in my um, platforms within the, the, the mission approach. Really important here, it makes sure that we can avoid duplication and reinventing the wheel. It builds and makes space of partnerships while at the same time identifying opportunities to support and complement existing developments and activities. It creates an environment where innovation and creation are valued and where we can develop the new and enhance the existing. And just before I conclude, if that's okay, I, I would like to take the opportunity to thank Scottish Land Commission, Hamish, uh, David and, and Cathy in particular for their invaluable support with the Clyde Mission work. So thank you. I shall now hopefully stop sharing. Great. Well done, John. Thank you very much. I should say before we get on to the discussion, um, apologies from, uh, from Gemma Kitson from NHS Greater Glasgow, who was going to contribute to this session, but unfortunately she, she, uh, she fell ill uh, yesterday and wasn't able to join but she sends her, sends her apologies. Um, right, let's go on to uh, discussion then. So, uh, as before, any questions you've got, please, um, or comments that you've got, please put them in the, the chat function. I'll try and, I'll try and uh, uh, moderate those and use those. Um, but let me kick things off. So, to both, uh, both Suzanne and John, I suppose one of the big questions is, what, from your experience, what are the things that most aid taking a collaborative approach? What helps? I think from, um, from our perspective, it's, it's being open and, and transparent um, and building that trust among um, partners. And I think that's the, the, the biggest thing for us and, and not to think that it's a quick process because these things take quite a bit of time um, to work up before you gain trust from partners as well. Yes. I think one of you mentioned actually that in a way it's almost it's like an investment. I mean, you are you're making an investment where you expect to pay off in the future, but it's not going to happen immediately. Yes. Absolutely, yes. yes. Anything, anything else from you, the other Suzanne? Sorry, that's going to be very difficult to know. I know. <laughs> Your surname yeah, goes down with R as well. That doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've, we've, so we've both started working together in the last couple of months and we haven't quite worked out how we differentiate between ourselves yet. We're going by colours of clothes quite often. Yeah. You've like, both got a green top on, haven't you? Oh, oh gosh. Well, half is on and I'm thinking it wasn't planned. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was actually going to say exactly the same thing um, from not just this project, but from previous projects where partnership working has been key, that trust is so important and that does take time and, and understanding different people's perspectives and point of views um, and understanding also not always going to agree as well yeah. and, and taking that forward. Um, but know that you're, knowing what your end point you want to get to, but everyone might not agree on how they want to get there, but they know what they want to achieve at the end of it. I think yeah. that's the important thing is to have that vision. 
And I suppose, John, that really ties into the whole mission-based approach, doesn't it? Just remember to unmute there. Um, so, so my thunder there, Charlie. Um, no, it, 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 it does. I mean, I think um, uh, it, it's, it's almost that one of those kind of perfect kind of policy questions, is it, in a sense? Like, you know, should we collaborate? Well, well of course we should. Um, but the more tricky part is, 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 bringing that, is bringing that to life. And what Suzanne and Suzanne have said um, that kind of really resonates with me is that thing about you know openness, transparency, and and trust across. You know, I was I was intrigued by by your presentation, Suzanne and Suzanne, about the whole you know the breadth of partners. And again, I could I could uh, I could I could uh, um, you know I, I could uh, I'm sorry, I'm for appreciate or. Or whatever that that kind of approach and stuff like that, and but you know it does bring its, its challenges with it as well. Um, I think in terms of the the, the the mission approach, you know, um, common goals, um, but to understand how efforts and resources can be combined, um, is really really key um, across a, a range of organisations that maybe have, have different but complementary functions. I suppose I think from and. Um, it's a difficult thing to say, being a 32-year civil servant, but, but the mission approach is that kind of welcome, welcoming uncertainty um, and, and working with it, but working with it in a collaborative um, approach because it can drive innovation and creation and all that kind of, that kind of stuff. And I think as well, um, again, I have a kind of perspective on this from time in government, but I think about you know, if you, if you can get that shared aims and common goals, it's about sharing responsibility and, and ownership of delivery, um, not not just not just kind of consulting or whatever. So I think all that kind of stuff all combines for key aspects of collaboration. Um, I think, Charlie. Yeah. No, thank you. Yeah. And actually, that whole question of uncertainty—if you've—if you've built the trust, then you can actually you can tackle the uncertainty together. Uh, and that, that's, uh, that's absolutely crucial. I suppose this flip side of the, the question I ask in terms of you know, what are things that really aid it? I mean, what are the big barriers in your experience to, to try and get across? I suppose, um, Suzanne Robertson, that you know, maybe ask you to kick off with that. Yeah, I think, I think some of the barriers um, that, that we certainly experienced was, was just getting those partners initially on board. Um, <laughs> And, and almost explaining because at the end of the day, everyone is focused on their own end goal. And that's about, so for estate agents, that's about selling the property. For property owners, they're looking to sort of maximize their return. And um, for retailers, they're looking to get the best sort of deal that they can. And I think for us, it was about sort of showcasing that end use that it's in everybody's interest. Because if you've got these vacant properties clustered together, then it's not going to help the estate agent. It doesn't help your town centre or your community. And it was essentially getting that key message over. And once we'd done that, you could almost see the penny drop with the stakeholder group. Right. And, and how we sort of went about that was, was to take quite a bit of the investment that had happened in Peterhead. And when I collated the figures, there was around 305 million over a space of two years had gone on in the outskirts of Peterhead. But nobody actually knew within that stakeholder group because they were all focused on their own um, issues at that particular point. And, and they were almost shocked to say, well, we didn't know this was happening. We didn't know what was coming up. Um, and again, it was our education piece in terms of, well, this is what's happening. Um, here are the opportunities that we can work together. It's not going to be easy in terms of getting over that initial, we all need to learn lessons. So as Aberdeenshire Council, we knew that there were certain areas that we needed to tackle. Um, and, and from estate agents and things like that as well, it was that whole education piece. But I think the hardest part was just getting over that initial discussion and everybody being quite open and, and realising that each of us had our own challenges. Right. But by coming together collectively, it was going to make the, if you like, the process much easier. Right. So, so communication was absolutely key to that. Then. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Suzanne, anything you want to add to that? I wasn't involved at the time, um, but I know from like from a council perspective, getting just people within the council to work together as well from different departments and, and to give people on the outside just that one point of place 
to go to. I think that makes such a big difference. And it's something we've seen um, from a planning perspective from the COVID response as well. Um, mm. In terms of giving businesses outside of council um, people that one place to go that's not confusing and gives a clear um, can give a clear answer to a question quickly and gets over the bureaucracy that people often perceive when dealing with a local authority. So mm -hmm. I think working within a local authority setting is just as important as working with those external external partners as well and getting the buy-in from your colleagues um, in the way you work as well is important. Got a couple of questions coming. Actually, I'm just going to ask you one more, Suzanne uh, uh, Ryan. Does it coming into into this fresh? Was there anything that really surprised you about it? I just think that um, I think it's well, it's picked up on the points there about the willingness to do something different um, and to be fleet of foot. I think it says. I think that's a really yeah. a really good expression um, for how everybody has worked together here. They've seen challenge and it is a challenge in Peterhead um, to get that investment in the town centre and to build up the confidence there but they've said well we know this is a problem but how can we deal with this differently um, and I think the collaboration element of that is what has made this successful uh, as Susanna said that outlining those different understandings and perceptions bringing those together for that common purpose um, and that's what I think is, is really brilliant about the scheme is that it, it's done that so well and although it has taken time, not that huge amount of time, really, when you think about it. And when dealing, um, as I said in the presentation, with big issues too around COVID and, and, um, and town centres more generally, to see that decline in the retail vacancy rate um, and to see confidence coming back into the town has been really encouraging and a great basis to work from, I think, to continue to, uh, to bring that development out into other parts of the town centre that haven't yet benefited but still need investment and focus. Right. Okay, great. Charles, Charles, can I, yeah, just, Charles. I'm going to move on. I was just I was going to, if I, if I could be um, so bold, it's just to, to, to offer um, something in. I, I agree with, I, again, um, the stuff that, Su that Suzanne and Suzanne have said there, who, who chimes with my experience of this, um, identifying vision, you know, and, 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 and all that kind of stuff. But I think with the mission as well, it was there was this, it was not so much a barrier, um, but you know we were taking a, a different approach to things that then we've maybe kind of traditionally taken in terms of kind of policy development. Um, so there was a bit of um, a bit of again it actually helped build the partnership. Just talking that through, what does that mean? And you know, and it might mean that different things or that slightly different things or different missions and all that kind of stuff. Um, but I think as well from from our perspective, um, I was, you know, that does does. There's, there's the concepts and there's the theories and all that kind of stuff, but 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 you are asking um, people to and very often busy people to bring to bring time and resource to the table to make these things work, and that gets back to that you know getting in early and, and, and sharing sharing the goals and, and the vision and that you know if you get this right you know really you know, could do really good things here, um, but and again this isn't a barrier, but um, but I think. Um, there's also through a lot of this work, um, you know, and I just need to just kind of look at this like, from my own personal perspective, I suppose, um, and probably others, that there is an opportunity for, for personal development and growth as you get involved in these pieces of work, um, as well as you can see the outcomes for the communities and business and the economy and all that kind of stuff. There is a you know, there's what do really you get from it in terms of who you want to get as an individual. I mean, I think it reminds us that uh, in any collaboration, there are individuals involved in it and having regard to both the individual interests as well as the, the broader organisational and community interests is important. Excellent. There's a question from Ian uh, Wardrop here about how important is it coordinating the public sector infrastructure in homes, education, schools and the like um, to, to actually provide a foundation for that collaboration. Suzanne. Uh, Robertson. I think that's um, really important and in terms of Peterhead that's actually our next step and um, we are at the moment just going through planning a new community campus and we're at that, those very early stages at the moment but again it's taken that sort of approach where we've gone back to, to look at every investment that's going into Peterhead and, and we're building up quite a bit of database at the moment and looking to take up master planning approach in terms of the time moving forward. And again, that's to link uh, um, the community campus, 
what's going to be the impact to the town centre and then what are those services essentially that the community are still looking for. Right. So it's really important. We're at the very early stages of developing that plan at the moment, but I think that will almost create the vision moving forward in terms of where those key investments need to go into Peterhead. Right. And that might then tie into sort of community wealth building initiatives, which will build up, build on that. Yeah. Absolutely. That's um, something that we are looking at again um, with the community compass, because again, ideal project to, to start in that community wealth development piece. Yeah. Okay, good. Suzanne, anything you want to add to that? So you smile. Oh, no, that's fine. John, from your because from your uh, from your mission approach, looking at the partners that you had at the start of the thing, quite a lot of public sector partners there working together. Absolutely. Um, this is a this is going to sound a bit repetitive, but again, you know, Suzanne and Suzanne uh, captured quite a lot of it uh, in, in what they were saying, but. I think one of the, the, the powerful things about the mission um, and, and its collaborative element is it helps us to understand that, um, that architecture, you know, that Kaloid architecture and, and, and what is already out there and the role of the mission in terms of how it adds value, either in terms of um, new innovations or actually supporting what is already there. And, and recognising what's already been and all that kind of stuff. So um, that that the, the mission the mission and, and how we get together and all that kind of stuff allows us to see what, what is going on. Absolutely. Good. Well look, we're approaching half past now. So but any last points from from uh, from the three of you that you'd like to make before I try and that's on a heroic attempt to try and wrap the whole thing up. Suzanne? No, nothing from me. No? Thanks, Charlie. No? Suzanne Suzanne? Suzanne? No, thank you though for okay. the opportunity to speak today and, and to Great. share what you're doing. Thank and John. Likewise, Charlie, huge thanks for the invite. It's been really, really good. It's been a, a, a really, good, really good debate. Good, great. Well, thank you all very much. And as you'll see from the chat function, a number of people have had to leave have been offering their thanks as well. Well, thank you all for uh, every, across all three sessions for uh, what you've put it, what you've put into this. Let me try and capture a, a few a few headlines um, obviously a proactive approach uh, to estate management is seen as being absolutely crucial here and a key part of being proactive of what we just learned from those practical examples there is that the importance of trying to take as holistic approach as possible to engage different interests uh, in this as part of that a lab, a holistic approach then understanding that the value of a particular site is uh, is not just the financial value that it has but the social value can be much more than the pounds and the pence to reference the guide uh, that, that we talked about earlier and the real key to making a success of, success of this is effective collaboration who to bring together why to bring why to bring them together with what purpose what to focus on how to do it, and the session that we had with the workshop gave us a lot of uh, a, a lot of uh, uh, perspectives uh, on that. Um, and one of the key perspectives I think from that for me was this importance of trying to get into other people's shoes, just to understand their perspectives, not just to see how they were seeing things, but to understand where more value might be created um, fr fr from understanding the different perspectives understand where the unintended consequences might occur the more you've uh, the more you've explored that but that takes time and there's a lot of investment that has to uh, to, to be made to build that uh, openness and, and, and transparency on which all effective trans uh, collaborations um, built and, and essentially that is all about that is about building trust and a relationship which is much more than simply a transactional relationship. It's not a one-off, well, you do this for me, I'll do this for you. It's about building a, a relationship which is, uh, which is trans transformative, which can really help generate real change in, in the sort of examples that we've seen, uh, seen there in the last session. So very difficult to sum up uh, such a broad uh, range of conversation and discussion, but those were some of the things that, uh, that, that I took from it. So, I think it only remains for me to thank all of the speakers, thank all of you for 
participating in this session and uh, to wish you well for the future in your, in your efforts to take a more proactive approach to, to land management. Thank you all very much.